So I find myself somewhat perplexed today by what seems to be a genuine mystery. This Roadhinger's wristwatch, if you like. Now this little guy went MIA for a couple of weeks until it was finally found in a trouser pocket from a pair of trousers that you guessed it had been into the washing machine. Now this starts for me when I get a panicked call from my good friend who's absolutely convinced she put the first gift her partner ever gave her into the spin cycle. Now I've personally never put a watch into the washing machine, pretty much for the reason you would imagine, the same reason I've never tried putting my head into the dishwasher. It's just not a good idea. So I have no idea what to expect with this watch. I do have some questions that need answering. Did this in fact go into the washing machine? And if not, why isn't it running? Apparently this was serviced a couple of years ago. Now I have my doubts on that one, but my friend most definitely paid for that service. So let's find out if she actually got what she paid for. The Prim Calibre 66 itself is an extremely resilient and reliable little movement. So why has it stopped ticking? Did it go through the wash? Was it serviced two years ago? Why do I have two? And why do I think you should have one? So let's find out as we start this service and restoration that past me has been getting on with in the background. Hello folks, I'm David and hopefully today we can rescue this damsel in distress. Or at the very least make it so she doesn't have to explain to her partner why she went ahead and boil washed his Christmas gift. Now, with the dial off, we can begin to see some of the damage that's occurred. There's some definite rust, there's some watermarks, there's what looks like dried on soapy residue, so this is not a good sign for us. But before we can investigate any further, I need to get the power out of this watch and the balance out. Now, this is just for safety reasons. I don't want to damage the hairspring or have the watch rapidly unwind on me breaking some of the parts. Now you might notice there is a little black mark on our balance wheel. This is normally done when somebody removes the hairspring and puts it back on or uses this for timing purposes to correct a B error. There is definitely some work been done to this watch which makes me very surprised that it is this dirty and this grimy. Are these hairs and bits of dirt and whatnot? Did they get in because it actually went through the washing machine. I have my doubts, as I mentioned, but I am not sure. So I'd like to throw this one up to the comments. I know there's plenty of watchmakers that watch these things. Have you guys ever serviced a watch that's been through a washing machine? Did it look like this? I was kind of expecting more damage, so I'm still a little on the fence, but we'll investigate further, of course. Now the click is coming out, for those of you who don't know, this is the part of the watch that makes the clicking noise when it's wound, it's part of the ratcheting mechanism that goes click, click, click. Not very imaginatively named, but it is well, genuinely descriptive. So I'm going to disassemble the top of the barrel bridge here, and we find more and more dirt, more particles, more stuff that genuinely should not be in here. In fact, this watch is incredibly slippery to work on. It feels like it's covered in soap. I don't know what it is, but my screwdrivers are constantly wanting to slide and slip around. And I've worked on a Calibre 66 before. They're normally very easy to take apart. So barrel bridge comes off. This will reveal the barrel underneath the reason why it's called the barrel bridge. And that barrel will have the spring in it, which will store all the power for your watch. Now, I always like to flip my bridges around when I take them off because a time or two before I've been bitten by things being stuck underneath, but nothing in this case. Now, it's important to throw your screws around a bit just to show them who's boss, and my cats genuinely enjoy watching me crawl around on the floor looking for parts, so it's just a win-win for everyone. Now, I try and be careful as I take off the train of wheels bridge because it's easy to bend the pivots underneath, and then there really will be tears before bedtime. As you can see, the center second wheel comes out, the intermediate wheel. There is no rust which is quite surprising on the pivots or at least quite surprising to me in this case but there is a lot of hair and dirt and genuine debris that would have stopped this thing working I'm almost sure. 
Now, as past me gets on with the hard work in the background, I guess I should explain why I think you should own a Prim Calibre 66. Now, to do this, I'd like to talk a little bit about time and timekeeping and just how much we take accurate timekeeping for granted. Pretty much all of us are carrying around a timekeeping device connected to an NTP server that's so accurate, it even accounts for continental drift, something that's Honestly mind-blowing to me, but so common, we don't even give it a second thought. I am, of course, talking about your phone, and even if you don't carry a phone, it's so cheap and easy these days to strap a $10, $20 Casio to yourself and get a timekeeping accuracy of just a few seconds a month. The keeping of time, in fact, has become so easy for us, we now use it as a unit of distance. Have you ever found yourself answering the question how far away something is with a unit of time instead of a unit of distance? It's actually a very common phenomenon nowadays. How far away is the shop? It's about 15 minutes by car or a 40 minute walk. Time and being able to keep it accurately is essential to our society. Even watching something like this YouTube video is governed by time. Network computer systems like the internet can't actually function without all the computers involved having very accurate timekeeping devices in them. Now, in the video in the background, you can see me disassemble the keyless and motion works here. Don't worry, I'll cover all the pertinent details as we get this back together. The reassembly, I'll go into the nerdy bits for those of you who are really interested. But as I was saying, you don't have to go very far back into our history to find out that access to accurate timekeeping is actually a pretty modern thing. If you go back a hundred years or so, you'll find knowing exactly what the time was, was pretty much the purview of the wealthy and if you go further back than that if you go back far enough for the average person looking up to see where the sun was in the sky was pretty much as good as it got it wasn't actually until the creation of mass-produced wristwatches in the 30s and 40s that the working person had a reliable way to tell the time. Now, this charge into mass production, somewhat led by the Amiga Tissot merger in 1930s, which would also lead to the creation of the Swatch Group, was the first time in our history that the average person would have had access to a personal, reliable timekeeping device. Astounding to me that you could live your life without knowing what time it was, was, but for most of human history, that's exactly what we've done. Now, I'm going to upset some of you by calling modern mechanical watches an affectation, a piece of jewellery, mechanical artwork, if you like, and as such, unnecessary. I love watches, don't get me wrong, I have an entire YouTube channel devoted to them. I love the history, the ingenuity that goes into them, and in a modern sense, the craftsmanship that goes into decorating a high-end mechanical watch. But I also love this mass-produced plain Jane movement you can see before you. Now, it was mass-produced in-house by Prim in the 1960s to do one job, to keep accurate and reliable time for a low cost. This was a job it did extremely well. I highly recommend this movement. You should get one. It's superb. These men and these watches change the way our society works. They change the world. What Omega Tiso did for Western Europe, Prim did for the Czech Republic and some of Eastern Europe. Now we've gone ahead and completed our disassembly. You can see all the parts going into a cleaning basket to go into a watch cleaning machine, not the washing machine. Now I would genuinely recommend against putting your watch in the washing machine. I mean, you can if you want to. I'm not your mum here. But all that happened to me was the creation of a very upset little Scottish woman knocking on my door. And I can assure you, you don't want one of those. Although... Your mileage might vary, and I can't actually guarantee you'll get an upset little Scottish woman if you throw your watch into the washing machine. So the spring is being oiled along with the barrel. The spring will have some Mobius 8200 grease on it, and then I'll wind it back up with my vintage winders. I'm going to link a lot of the oils and what the winders are called and stuff in the description. People often ask me. So I'll try and put as much information down in the description as I possibly can to help you guys who are thinking of having a go at watch repair. 
Uh, or maybe you just watch collectors and you're just interested in the tools, or maybe you've been doing a late night YouTube deep dive and you found yourself here by accident. In which case, welcome. Um, people often tell me they use me to fall asleep. And as a long term insomnia sufferer, um, you are welcome. Now, the spring has been wound in. You have to be careful at the end there so you don't catch the hook on the opening in the winder. Then you'll just get a snapped hook and you'll end up having to buy another spring. They're not too expensive, however, but that's really no reason to not be careful. So our spring is wound in and you'll see me now decant this spring into the pre-oiled barrel. And the spring itself, as I mentioned, has a little bit of grease. Now, here I'm going to demonstrate I'm a bit of an idiot. This... Uh, winder is actually slightly too large i do get it in there it did take a bit of jiggery pokery so i spared you that and now the barrel arbor will have to go into the middle of the spring this is another one of those genuine pains in the backside this is one of my least favorite parts of watchmaking you can use a pin vise to make this a little bit easier for yourself sometimes sometimes it works sometimes not you've got to get the thing at an angle and you've got to get it in between that spring you've got to make sure the hook of the arbor is engaged with the hook of the spring and that the spring is the right way around otherwise you'll break the spring the arbor won't engage again you'll just get a watch that doesn't work now i am using a 3d printed uh, barrel pusher to push the lid on with even pressure all around you can actually buy these things from aliexpress for a couple of bucks uh, i always say i am looking for mine i am still looking for mine i just keep 3d printing them it works fine now it comes to the oiling of the watch and I certainly believe that adage that if you ask five different watchmakers how to oil a watch you'll get eight different answers. I try and listen to all the advice I can get so if you have some for me please do leave it down in the comments. I am genuinely open to learning that's what I'm here for. Now I also don't show every single step of oiling and every drop of oil because my videos are long enough already. YouTube tends not to like it. And as much as I do like putting people to sleep, I don't want to bore the socks off absolutely everyone. So I'm putting in the bridge for the center wheel. I'm also putting in the escape wheel. There's no real need for the escape wheel to be in right now, but it won't do any harm. And it looks like past me has decided to do it in this order, and I'm not going to argue with him. So we'll get this screwed down. Should be fairly easy to secure in place. Like I mentioned, the Caliber 66 is a great movement. It has a great design to it, in my opinion. Very, very easy to work on. Intermediate wheel goes in. This should be closely followed by uh, cleaning in Pithwood. Now, I've cleaned all of the pivots in Pithwood, even though all of the pivots have already been through a watch cleaner. Uh, I still like to give them that extra clean. Pithwood is great. It's useful for pivots and tools, all sorts of things. Now, in goes the center second wheel. That will be the driver for the second hand. The second hand will be directly connected to that. And now the barrel bridge can go on. The barrel bridge is genuinely easy to fit, or normally I find it easy to fit. The train of wheels bridge, on the other hand, is a total pain in the backside. Maybe if you have more experience than me, this goes easier. I often need a cup of tea just to go outside, take a walk, relax for a minute. It's very easy, I have found, to crush the pivots while you're doing this. You need to make sure that your pivots come through the top of the jewels on the top. Um, or at least I like to make sure. I'm not trying to give anyone instruction here. As I've said in the past in many videos, I am more of a watch collector who's just beginning a journey into watchmaking. So while I do think you can follow along with me if you want to, I normally get a decent result. I certainly don't want to be giving out any firm instructions. In fact, to that and if you see me do something wrong please do let me know in the comments as i mentioned i am here to learn so i'm going to get that bridge screwed on i hold it down with a piece of pegwood to make sure that it doesn't slip and i end up crushing the jewels because uh, that will just end up with bent pivots and while there are a few tools to unbend them they tend to be rather expensive and probably more of an art form than a science to get them to actually work. I've heard other watchmakers describe Bergeon's pivot straightener as just an expensive way to bend your pivots even more. So I'd rather avoid having to do that if at all possible. 
Now again, a bit more oil here for our click before it goes on. Some of that that looks like dirt there is just literally baked into the metal. I couldn't get it off even with scraping. I think it's errors in the plating. It's not going to do any harm on the other hand. So for this, I'm just going to leave it. There is no way to get it off without replating, I believe. So the click and the click screw goes in. Now, I've been caught a foul by the screw that holds the click down before. A lot of the time it bottoms out to allow you to do that, to allow the click to return and function. If I use the wrong screw there, the click will just get stuck and it won't function. So a little bit of oil for our ratchet or our crown wheel, should I say, our crown wheel spacer. And our crown wheel will go on and then the ratchet wheel will go on after it. Now, I just like to say I don't script these videos, so if you do hear me cover the same ground twice, I apologize. But these things are already extremely difficult to make. Now, the editing often takes me a week. If I was a better editor, maybe I could get it done quicker. But for me, this is a very lengthy process. And the reason I use three cameras and split screens and multiple angles is because when I first got into watch repair a few years ago now, I looked at the videos on YouTube and without throwing any shade, just as a complete noob, I often find it difficult or at least I found it difficult to see the position of where things were within the movement. It didn't seem to be a coherent whole, rather a random collection of close ups. Now, again, not throwing shade at anyone. Um, that was definitely my inexperience. That's not going to be necessary for everyone. You can see our wheels spinning freely here. But to get back to it, what I try and do is create a coherent story with my editing. So even if you're a complete watch noob, um, you can still get an idea of where all the parts are going. Now we're on the dial side and I'm going to put the Canon pinion on first. Again, this is one of those things that can bite you. It's happened to me. If you don't put your Canon pinion on first, you can put your minute wheel in, which is the point of the movement I'm oiling now. The minute wheel will live there. And then when you come to press fit your Canon pinion, you can actually end up shearing one of the teeth off the minute wheel. Ask me how I know. And then you'll need a new one, quite simply. So after our minute wheel goes on there, we can put a little bit of oil for our intermediate winding wheel, a little bit of grease in this case. And then we can get the cover plate on that covers up the intermediate winding wheel and the minute wheel. And the reason for this cover plate is if you didn't have it when you turned your watch dial side up, these parts would fall off. Um, so I'm going to get that screwed down now. As I've mentioned, the Prim Caliber 66, you definitely want one of these things. It's so many flavors to it, and it's such a seminal work here in the Czech Republic. But more importantly, it's easy to take apart and put back together. Or easy might be the wrong word. It's as easy as a center second driven mechanical watch gets. It's extremely well built. So our setting lever pusher going in there, and again, this will need to be grease. Use a heavier grease. I use a heavier grease where you will get metal on metal contact. Now, I actually have a new grease coming for this. This is not a synthetic grease I'm using now. I can't remember which Mobius flavor it is, but there's a synthetic grease that is better for this job. It's been stuck in customs for quite a while now. Um, I blame the Brexit, but what can you do? Stuff gets stuck in customs. So our winding and sliding pinion are going in now, our winding pinion. If you've heard these referred to by other names, by the way, it's simply because of the many traditions in watchmaking, French, German, English, Swiss, of course, Japanese. All these parts have slightly different names depending on where you were trained or they can have. So if you hear another watchmaker refer to them as something else, they're not wrong. It just comes from that tradition of watchmaking across multiple uh, countries. Now I've got the sliding winding pinion in. I'm going to go ahead and get the winding stem in. That also needs a bit of grease because it will be making that metal on metal contact. Now, this particular watch uses a captive spring for the yoke, which is very nice. Less chance of blasting it into orbit. And here you can see a little bit of how the keyless works work, changing between winding and setting mode. 
So the yoke will go in and this captive spring is just a joy. I love this part of this movement. It's not specific to Prim. Um, I don't think that they were the inventor of the captive spring in a watch movement, but they do use it. And as such, it is quite nice not to send parts into orbit. Now we're going to put a cover plate with the setting jumper on here. That will allow the jumper to jump backwards and forwards. A bit more grease will be needed. And for things like this, you are normally dealing with the world's tiniest screws. Um, it's funny, when I first started this, these, these looked tiny to me. And I helped a friend fix a laptop last week. And the screws in the laptop look ginormous, which a few years back for me would not have been the case at all. But the cover plate goes down and you should now see the works work or the keyless works work to change the watch between winding and setting. Now we need to clean the jewel and chapon from the shock settings. Now these aren't official ink block shock settings. They are very, very similar. These were in house to prim. There are a number of shock settings. Many manufacturers did their own. This is prim's interpretation of it seems to be quite good. One thing I would say is that the settings where the chapon goes, they're very deep. So they are very, very difficult to get back in. Now, earlier revisions of this movement used a bog standard ink block setting, and it's a little easier. Anyhow, getting this movement cleaned or this uh, jewel cleaned, I'm now going to put it under a microscope just to do the oiling. Much easier under a microscope, very difficult even under a loop. You want about half the surface of the jewel, the interior surface covered in oil. So I have been recommended and that's been working for me over the last couple of years. It's a similar uh, procedure as to recommended in a lot of old books, which if you're wondering is where I got most of the information I use for watch repair. It's old books. Uh, I'm a big fan of reading and book learning, so that was what did it for me. You can most certainly follow along with my videos, though, or other watchmakers' videos as you see fit. You'll definitely learn something, and it should be a good deal of fun. So the shock setting goes back together in the bottom of the watch here. This is the dial side, which will allow me to put the pallet fork in, and then I can get the balance in. Now, there was also a shock setting, of course, on the top of the balance bridge, but I'm going to not take that one apart and oil it for you on camera because it's exactly the same as I've demonstrated with the one on the bottom. They're the same shock setting. So pallet fork and pallet bridge going in now. And again, I'm going to be try and careful to make sure that the pallet is through the jaw before I do any screwing down. And I'm going to hold it with a bit of pegwood after I get these screws in. A few of you have asked me, by the way, how I remember which screw goes where. It's a combination of experience. Um, I rarely have to refer back to a video now to see what goes where. So it definitely experience helps. But also the watch will kind of tell you. You just look at the holes on the plate. If they're tapered, then it would need a tapered screw. If they're flat bottom, then it would be a flat bottom screw and so on and so forth. You really just got to get stuck in. Now I'm going to wind some power into the watch. Now the pallet fork was in, pallet fork after power is wound in should tick backwards and for, uh, forwards nicely after you check it. So we're going to check that now. Sorry, after you wind it, the pallet fork should then have a nice snap to it like this one does. So problem number one, the first big problem we hit with this is I believe that this movement and this spring has been magnetized. You can see the coils are sticking together. When I push them together like so, they don't spring apart. And if I pull it up, they spring apart. And if I put it down, they go back into concentric circles. So this is a sure clue for magnetism. Now I'm going to use this old cell phone, which has a magnetometer into it. And sorry about the terrible footage, but you should be able to see when I bring the watch over the sensor, you will see a spike in magnetism. This is a dead set clue that your watch has been magnetized. Magnetism and mechanical watches do not mix at all. So in order to demagnetize this, I'm going to have to put the balance in. You do not want to just try and wave your hairspring over a demagnetizer. In my experience, that can lead to a tangled mess. 
been there, done that, does not work well. You want the watch together and you want to demagnetize the whole thing in one go uh, would be my advice. This is how I've seen other people do it. And again, it's been working for me. So we're going to get that balance in. You can see the hairspring there looking very, very sad. It does amazingly tick up, which is more a testament to the people that designed and built this thing than it is to my skill here. But I am very happy to see that tick up. However, this would keep time very, very poorly. With that spring stuck together like this, we'd either be running super quickly or super slowly. Uh, difficult to tell, but you would not want to leave it in this condition. You would definitely 100% want to demagnetize that. Now, while I was disassembling the top shock spring, it actually came out. It's supposed to be held captive. Um, but these things don't really obey the laws of physics from what I've seen. These are painful to get back in. I end up pinging this one a few times. Um, I'm trying to lift it up here and you'll see, I think that it just goes whoomp. It's gone. It's minuscule and it's gone. <laughs> Now, I spent about 40 minutes looking around the floor for this thing, and you should be able to see it there just under the balance. What happened? I reviewed the camera footage after spending about 40 minutes looking for it. What happened is it hit the side of the bridge and bounced back into the movement. I mean, you couldn't make it up. These things are springs, so they want to spring and they weigh about a nanogram. They weigh almost nothing. So if they spring at you, they can often get stuck on your clothes. You won't even know they're there. Um, I found shock springs in the weirdest places after losing them because they've become stuck to my clothes and I, I've taken a small break from looking them and then they end up under the kitchen fridge. It's just avoid avoid decoupling them in the first place. It's difficult, though. But there we go. It's gone back in. The jewel and chapon have obviously been oiled and cleaned the same way we did for the bottom ones. But we're just going to get that in. And I'm not too concerned that it stopped ticking there because I'm putting some pressure on the top, which will put pressure on the pivot, which will be enough to stop the watch. But you can see the hairspring is still it's not in a good shape. It's completely stuck together. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get any footage of demagnetizing the watch, but you literally just wave it over a demagnetizer. And now you can see our spring looks to be perfect. That is exactly what I want to see. So we'll need to get it on a time grapher, which for those of you who don't know, is an instrument for measuring time. But before we do that, we'll need to get it oiled. Now, again, I'm doing this under a microscope. You want enough oil, from what I understand, to just cover a little bit. If you put too much oil in, it'll wick through and it'll be the same as having no oil. Now, this is very, very tricky. This is probably one of the hardest bits of putting a watch back together is to get the oil right. I tend to go in on the first pass and put just a little bit and then I'll study the footage under the microscope and add as needed. But here are our time graph for results, and they are absolutely superb. You couldn't ask for any better. Now, there is a tiny B error, but under a millisecond, so of no concern to me. The rate is fantastic. The amplitude is fantastic. I'm going to change the watch from dial up to dial down. You might have seen, or from dial up to crown down, you might have seen me just alter the uh, the time grapher there and go back to it. And you see it's not quite as good with the case in a downward position. I'll leave that to settle. And in fact, I did for about half an hour. The amplitude picked up and all was right with the world. I could not have asked for a better result. So I'm going to use a crystal press to press the crystal on because this watch has no bezel. The crystal will ultimately go on before the movement goes in the case. Um, that one's quite important because trying to get it in there without a crystal press can be very difficult. And now we just need to get our hour wheel on and the dial spacer. And we can get to putting the dial on this thing, getting it back in the case and making a strap for this watch, which I will be doing. I'll be making a strap out of crocodile because my friend is a school teacher, specifically a teacher of little children. And I think the crocodile would be kind of cool for the kids. So hopefully she enjoys that. The children enjoy it too. 
But before we get too far ahead of ourselves here with Torca strap making, we still need to get the hands on this thing and make sure everything works. Now, pushing the hands on looks quite simple. It isn't. There's a myriad of things that can go wrong during this step. It needs to be fully tested to check the alignment and also make sure the hands don't bump into each other. I believe there was a famous watchmaker that once said, I love watchmaking apart from the hands. And that's kind of how I feel. I run into lots of problems with hand setting. My next tool will actually be a proper hand press just to take part of the pain away from this, even though it looks from the outside to be a very simple thing. So this watch, as I mentioned, will have to get checked. The hands on it can't bump into each other. If they do, they'll fall off. They also need to be aligned correctly. Now I'll do a quick test before I put it back in the case, but no doubt by the time you see that test, it will already be back into its case. It's worth noting as well that I've done a full clean out of this case. The crystal is old. It is scratched. It's the way my friend wanted it. She wanted it as she remembered it, not as a brand new piece, which is Oftentimes why you'll find Rolex collectors won't send their Rolexes back to a Rolex or a Rolex AD because they come back looking perfect minus the scratches, minus the dial damage, minus everything. And this devalues them to a certain degree in the sentimental stakes for some people, but it also devalues them in the monetary stakes. Now that's not a thing here. She just wants the watch back as she remembers it. So I've given it a good clean and skipped the polish. Now, the nice thing is I am a fairly competent strap maker, so this should be easy. But of course, it's not going to be because no good deed goes unpunished. 13.4 millimeter lugs. Are you absolutely kidding me? That would probably be 13.5 on a good day. And you could wedge in there a 14 mil strap, no doubt, or a 13 mil strap. But as I happen to make straps for a living, or at least part of my living, are my friends probably not going to take the excuse that it almost fits? So I'm going to 3D print out a new template. I use this printer a lot. It's an Anet A8. People ask me about it, so I'll leave a bit of footage in here. Really simple and easy to use and really inexpensive. Mine was a gift from a friend several years ago. Been using it ever since. So for our strap, we're going to be using genuine uh, crocodile in this case, specifically crocodile hip. Now, this material is extremely expensive, as you can imagine, especially if it has the correct site certificates and everything, which you definitely should have. I'm also going to be using a bit of lambskin from the backing for the backing of this for the liner. Now, I'm going to apologize for the footage here. I've made several videos where I cover strap making in quite a bit of depth. Um, it is actually a little bit more difficult than you might think because watch straps have to be perfect. But for whatever reason on this run through, my camera's kind of pudding, so I'm going to leave out a lot of the detail and just show the highlights. Now, in order to cut both lambskin or crocodile, because it's so rubbery, you're going to need a knife that is razor sharp. I'm actually using a $3 knife from AliExpress, which I 100% do not recommend. It took me hours to re-grind it, reprofile it. I just did a video once where I said you could do leather work for $20, I think it was. And I ended up showcasing this knife, and it's been a bit of a meme ever since. But as you can see, with proper sharpening and re-grinding, it is extremely sharp. Would not recommend, however. Find your local knife maker, get him to make you a nice carbon steel knife, or even buy a decent $20 knife. This one is sharp, but I'll have to resharpen it every five minutes, I guarantee it. Now, because I'm using two materials that are incredibly stretchy, I'm going to need some reinforcement. The reinforcement I normally use for straps is called Velodon. Again, it's expensive, but this is kind of an expensive strap at this point, so it's a small part of the cost. Now, I use Velodon because it's stretch resistant and extremely thin. So you need to get this glued up into your strap. I'll also link the place where I buy this. I have no affiliation with them. They don't sponsor me. They don't know I exist, I'm sure. But it's difficult to find. And there's fake stuff out there. You know, uh, use your eBay at your own risk type of thing. So I'll link my supplier. He does it in small enough batches that it could be useful for you if you only want to make, you know, a handful of straps for yourself. 
So as I finish up this strap, again, apologies for the footage and the lack of clarity in exactly how it was made. I will cover it in another video, just sort of putting to the cameras. So as we come to a close here, I want to thank everyone for watching and sticking around this far. Hopefully you'll stick around to see what this strap looks like. And to answer the questions I posed at the beginning of the video, I do not think my friend got the service of this watch that she paid for a couple of years ago. There is no way that that was fully cleaned. I'm just going to come out and say it. I think the guy simply adjusted some B error out of the watch and handed it back to her after a day or two while charging her rather a lot of money. Did it go in the washing machine? Honestly, I'm not 100% certain. When she first gave it to me, I thought it had after working on it. Now, hmm, I'm going to leave that one for you to answer in the comments. Do you think this thing survived the washing machine? Or do you think that my friend was mistaken and maybe the trousers never entered the washing machine and it just spent a couple of weeks at the bottom of a laundry basket and coincidentally broke at exactly the same time? very difficult to say. Now I'm going to finish up the strap and I normally, just so you know, wouldn't cut around a template like this for this particular part of the process. I would normally mark this and cut it freehand. However, both crocodile and lamb are very, very difficult to mark. So this is kind of a bodge here. Um, definitely not the best way to do it. I normally would use a stiffer lamb, but I only had this very stretchy one in pink. You can buy slightly thicker lamb than I'm using here. I just thought this would be very nice for my friend. She likes pink. The watch is red. I'm going to put a contrast stitch on this thing. So it'll be red and white to match the dial. Hopefully it will look nice. We're going to find out, I am sure. Now there's the blanks. These need holes put in, in them and stitches. Unfortunately, that's all done off camera in this case. Like I say, I'll recommend some other videos if you want to see the proper strap making process. That just about brings me to the end of this. Our watch is back together. Our strap is almost made by the stitching and strap keepers. And I'm going to give you a look at this thing on my wrist. Now, I like small watches and I like this one. So I would definitely wear this. Um, some of you might think it's a little bit small and my friend's a little bit smaller than me. So that works out just fine. But I think this thing looks absolutely lovely. I kind of genuinely love the strap as well. Putting crocodile on something like this is extravagant, but I absolutely adore it. So all that remains is for me to thank you all for watching, for showing me some support. Please do like and subscribe, all that YouTube business. As I mentioned, these videos are difficult to make. If you want to speak to me, I read all the comments. So feel free to comment down below, good or bad. I'm a big lad. I can take it. Thank you all for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.